new beginning church in our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us again on tonight for Bible study. We pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. This week, I have been reviewing the book entitled Jonah, Navigating a Life Interrupted by Priscilla Schreiber. And we all know the story of Jonah. God gave Jonah clear directives. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to the Ninevites. Jonah didn't want to go. So he decided to run away. And he decided to run away from God. Jonah basically told God, I ain't doing that. And he went in a totally different direction. When we accept Christ as our Savior, Priscilla says that we sign up for divine interventions. And divine interventions means that God, is, it means God's interruptions. God can interrupt our lives whenever he wants to because he is God. He made us. What Jonah didn't realize was that it is a privilege to have your life interrupted by God. When God interrupts our lives every day, it means that God has chosen you above everyone else to partner with him in accomplishing his will. Jonah also did not realize that there are no gray areas when it comes to obeying God. When God speaks or allows you to see his hand, giving you the opportunity to participate in his purposes, you don't have a range of options to choose from on how you will respond. It's clear cut. It's plain and simple. It's black and white. You can either choose to obey or you choose to disobey. There is no neutral ground with God. Choosing to do nothing is really a decision to delay obedience. Priscilla says the word for delayed obedience is disobedience. Like Jonah, anytime we delay obeying God, we are disobeying God. Jonah clearly heard God's directive. God said to go to Nineveh. Jonah was 500 miles to the east. He went 500 miles to the east. But Jonah decided to go to Tarshish, which was 2,000 miles to the west. Nineveh was 500 miles to the east. Jonah decided to flat out disobey God, and he ended up in the belly of the fish. We may not go to the extreme like Jonah of disobeying God, but we all have run from God internally in our hearts. We run mentally when we detach our thought life from our tasks and go through the motions. We run emotionally by building up a callousness displayed by the attitude we show to others. We can even run spiritually from God by going through the motions without having any fellowship with God. So let us learn from John. Let's listen to God's directions. Once God gives us directions, let us follow them so we don't end up in the belly of the fish. The scripture is Isaiah 29 and 13, and it says, and so the Lord says, these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. I don't know about you, but I want to give God service from my heart, my mind, and my soul. I'll say yes. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I will agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. My heart says yes, Lord. 
to what you're doing with us and through us. Lord, we honor you today. We praise you. We magnify you. God, we thank you for another privilege just to come before you. Now, Lord, we come praying, Father God, and magnifying your name for you are worthy. We come praying, Father God, that we will always glorify you and that you will keep the glory. Lord, bless us tonight in Bible study. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us to stay focused on you. And bless us, Father God, that we will say yes to your will, yes to your way, and yes to your desire, Father God. We ask you, Father God, to bless us as we study this, your word, that your word will make a difference in our lives, that we will move forward and glorify you. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all on and all praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. No doubt about it, we ought to say yes to the Lord, yes to his will, and yes to his way. Thank you again tonight for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our Bible study here tonight. We are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We will conclude this chapter tonight, if it's God's will. We have the final two verses that make up this pericope, this final pericope, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses uh, 11 and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 is where we are tonight. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 11 through 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 11 through 12. <clears throat> we have been covering the book of Thessalonians for quite some time. We are in 2 Thessalonians now and we are we are always looking to see where God is leading us in the name of Jesus, and tonight's lesson is none different from that. Uh, we, we have called, God has called us to be witnesses for him, to be living vessels for him. So Paul, the Apostle Paul points this out again tonight. Please, as we cover these scriptures, remember one thing. Please remember that we do not do works in order for salvation. We do works because of our salvation. We never, ever, ever do work or deeds in order to be saved. We do works and deeds because we are saved. In other words, we do not work to become saved. We do not do things to become saved. But those things that we do, 
We do them because we're saved. And so tonight's lesson will focus much on this. And the, the topic for tonight is prayer. Uh, we know what prayer is. Prayer is a dialogue between God and man. Many of us have taken on prayer as a monologue. But prayer is a dialogue. When I say we've taken it on as a monologue, we believe that we ought to pray to God and God ought to give us what we ask for. And many of us have come to the conclusion that if we pray and God does not give us what we ask for, God has not answered our prayers. God has a way of answering prayers, and he answers our prayers regardless of what the answer is, and regardless of whether we like the answer. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says wait. So we have to make sure that we always, we always respect God's answer. We have to respect God's answers. We have to always walk with God in such a way that we respect what God has, has given us. And we're grateful for God's answer. Many of us, God has blessed us by saying no to our prayers. God has blessed many of us when God said no to what we ask him to do. Because God, remember, he sees above. He sees beyond. He sees farther than we can ever see and ever imagine. He's God. He sees everything. He knows everything. And he blesses us through everything. God has a way of blessing us in a way that we even sometimes don't want to be blessed, he still blesses us in the midst of our prayers. So when we talk about a dialogue, it is God talking to us and we're talking to God. A monologue is when man be begins to talk to God and man don't wait to see what God has to say. So we need to understand really, really well that prayer is when we communicate with God and God is communicating with us. That's what prayer is. Let's look at, let's look at these verses, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He says, therefore, we also pray always for you. For you that our God will count you worthy of this call. He's saying we always praying for you. It's a great thing to know that your pastor is always praying for you. It's a good thing to know that you are always being prayed over and being prayed on your behalf. It is always interesting and it's always a blessing to know that somebody who can get a prayer through to God, somebody is praying for you. He says, therefore, we always, when he say therefore, that means he's picking up from a previous verse. Let's look at verse number 10. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So he says, he says, Jesus Christ is coming. And regardless of what we do, regardless of how we feel, he's coming anyway. And he is coming to be glorified in his saints. In other words, when Jesus comes, the saints of God will glorify him. So tonight, when he comes to verse number 11, he says, therefore, we also pray always for you that our God who count you worthy of this call. In other words, he counts you worthy of glorifying him. Mm -hmm. And let me just share with you, none of us are worthy of doing anything for God. None of us are worthy of being called the saints of God. It's only Jesus Christ who makes us worthy. What Jesus did on Calvary, giving his life as a in a voluntary way, what he did on Calvary, he died for us 
And that and that alone made us worthy. We are considered worthy. And, and we'll see that in the rest of this verse. He says, therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count. The word count means to be deemed. The word count means that we are not worthy, but we are considered worthy. We are deemed worthy. We are only deemed worthy because of Jesus. We're not deemed worthy because of anything that we have done. The word count means that, that we have been deemed worthy and God thinks good of us and thinks well of us. So the word count means that God thinks well of us and he only thinks well of us based on who Jesus made us to be. So we, we gotta make sure that we understand that we are only worthy through Jesus Christ. The only way we're worthy is through him and through him alone. So he says, we, we, God would count you worthy, would count you worthy, count you, reckon you to be worthy. So this, this is a, a situation where God has, has made us worthy. He's counted us as worthy. We're not worthy of anything. At our very best, we're nothing more than filthy rags before God. So he counts us to be worthy. He counts us to be worthy. So when we look at this, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross makes us or considers us or deems us to be worthy of this call. The word call means invitation. The word call simply means that God has invited us to join him where he's already at work. God is at work all around, around us. Henry Black, Black, Blackaby, Henry Blackaby says it well in his book entitled Experiencing God. He says that God is at work all around us and it is our responsibility to join God where he's already at work. Here Paul supports this principle by, by saying to us that we are deemed worthy, we are counted worthy of the calling. We are counted worthy of the invitation. In other words, we are not worthy of the invitation. We are not worthy even to glorify God, but God counts us worthy because of what Jesus has done on the cross. So we are counted worthy of the calling He's, we are counted worthy of the invitation. The word calling invitation. This is an invitation that has been given to us through Jesus Christ. It's the invitation. And this invitation that has been given to us through Jesus Christ was made possible by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on Calvary. So we have a calling, we have a duty, we have an invitation. And this invitation is for us to walk worthy. Look at what he says, and fulfill all the good pleasures of his goodness and the work of faith with power. It is our responsibility to fulfill, to fulfill, to supply and per perfect. It is our responsibility to perfect the calling that God has called us to do. The calling has, that God has placed in us. The supply that God has given us. It is God. God has called us. God has called us. He has made us or deemed us. He has counted us as worthy. And we are to fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in the work of faith with power. <laughs> we need to perfect what God has done. We are to fulfill what God has done. God has already supplied us with what we need, so we have to fulfill it. We must fulfill what God has done, all of it. To the fact that it is God's good pleasure. This, this, this phrase, God's good pleasure, means God's satisfaction. Through God's satisfaction. You see, we can never satisfy God. But Jesus became the living sacrifice. And he satisfied God so that we can be deemed righteous. 
He is the perpetuation, propitiation, meaning that he, he satisfied God's desire for mankind. No angel could satisfy him. No prophet could satisfy him. No priest could satisfy him. Only the death bearing Jesus, of Jesus Christ could satisfy God. And Jesus did it over 2,000 years ago. So he says, since, since Jesus has put forth the good pleasure, since Jesus has put forth the kindness and the good pleasure to the point that God is now satisfied, then it becomes ours to have faith and to work. It is ours to labor. This word, this word work means to labor. And it is a labor of faith. It is walking with God, believing that God will allow us to glorify him and believing that God will bring to pass what God has promised. It's a faith walk. And a, a faith walk is one of assurance, assurance, not insurance, but assurance, meaning that we believe it even when we can't see it. If we can see a thing, we don't have to worry about it because we don't have to have faith in it. If we can see a thing, then that says to us that when we can see something, we don't have to have faith that it's there. But when we cannot see it, we have to have faith that God will deliver it. So as we work, as we produce, God is remembering what we have done. But remember, my key point tonight is don't think that you're working in order to be saved, but you are working because you are saved. We are working because we are saved. Mm -hmm. We live the life we live because we are saved. And we have to walk in faith in such a way until we walk with power, we walk with force, we walk with ability. This word power is dunamis power. This dunamis power is the same power by which we get the word, from which we get the word dynamite. Dynamite is the ability. So this word power means that we have the ability to do things. And if we're not in Jesus Christ, we do not have that ability. And so what we need to understand is we have to work and do a work of faith, realizing that our work of faith is to glorify God with power, with power, with strength, with might. And this word uh, power is the word with force. The word power here is dunamis in the original Greek. It means explosive power. It means violent power. So we have to live in faith. We have to work in faith. And we have to walk in faith. And as we live, walk, and, and, and participate with God in faith, we will understand that this power is a wonderful thing. Right. We must do it with power. We must work in faith. We must do a work of faith with power. That which is done that is not in faith, it's sin. Amen. If you are working for the Lord and you do not have faith, that's what you do without faith is sin. Whatever you put your hands to and it's not in faith, it is sin. It is sin. So what you have to understand is that it's a wonderful thing when you walk in faith, when you work a work of faith, God supplies power, and we ought to do it with power. Amen. We ought to do it with enthusiasm. We ought not be dragging around when we're working for the Lord. We ought to work in power and work through the power that God has already supplied. My final verse is verse number 12. And we work this work of faith with power. Verse 12 says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ is, may be glorified in us. You see, people see us. They watch us. 
they know we are proclaiming Christianity. And because we are proclaiming Christianity, they're looking to see how we handle things. Let me just share with you, <clears throat> we must glorify God regardless of what we go through. He says that the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in us, in you. God needs to be glorified in you. God needs to be glorified through you. In the way you live, the way you act, the way you carry yourself, it must be in a way that God gets the glory. Oh, yeah. There's, a, there's an evangelistic principle known as frangelism. Frangelism is when you evangelize four different group of people. Friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Frangelism. What Paul is saying here, even 2,000 years ago, Paul is saying that we must have an e a frangelism type of evangelism. We must target. We must strengthen. We must look to our, our friends, our relatives, our associates, and our neighbors. We must always look to make an impression. These people are watching us. And we will only glorify God by way of fragilism impacting the lives of those four different groups. We must impact their lives. And when we impact their lives, and we impact their lives for Christ, God gets the glory. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified. Whenever the Bible uses the word name, the person that is named, they're looking for you to look beyond that name. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When a person talks about a name, it gives you the essence of that person. When a person talks about a name, it gives you the reputation of the person. When, when we talk about a person's name, it gives you the conduct of that person. When we talk about a person's name, it gives you the character of that person. So when we look to Jesus Christ and look to him in his name, he, first of all, it says, our Lord Jesus Christ. So if he's our Lord, that means he's our master. That means we obey him. That means we walk with him. Because he's our Lord, then we follow him. It says in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ, a possessive form, our, our Lord Jesus Christ. He belongs to us because we have accepted him. He belongs to us. He is our Lord Jesus Christ because of what he did on Calvary. We need to make sure that we understand really, really well that if we're going to get anything done in the Lord, if we're going to get anything done for the Lord, and if we're going to glorify the Lord, it will be done through Lord Jesus Christ, through our Lord Jesus the Christ. And that through our Lord Jesus the Christ may be glorified in you. We have, to, we have to be at a point in our lives where Jesus is glorified in us. And look what it says. Not only that he may be glorified in you and you in him. You're going to be glorified because of him. And it's, it's twofold here. First of all, we are to glorify him on earth. And, and we're going to be glorified in him after death. We're going to be glorified on earth. People will see us and they will try to give us the glory, but we're going to always point to him. To God be the glory for what he has already done. We have to make sure that we give God the glory in our lifestyles. Because in frangelism, we're targeting friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. People are watching us. People are watching the way we react to things. People are handling things based on how we handle things. Because they know we walk with God. They want to make sure as we walk with God, they can walk with God the same way. So as they walk with God, as we walk with God, they see us walking with God. God is glorified. Jesus Christ is glorified.
in us, through us. And one of these days, we're going to be glorified through him. We're going to be glorified. We're going to have glorified body. First of all, we have a relationship with him. If we're born again, if we're saved, we have a relationship with him. And as we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then we understand and we understand really well that that relationship can never, ever, ever be broken. We are saved. And once we are saved, we're always saved. You can't give your salvation back. You, can't, you cannot lose your salvation. God will not take your salvation away. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You have a relationship in Jesus Christ. That relationship will always be there. But when you become bad, when you become sinful, when you separate yourself from God, you do so by breaking fellowship. When you look at Luke chapter 15, you see the prodigal son there. The prodigal son was always his daddy's boy. When he was in the hall pen, when he did things wrong, he was still his daddy's boy. The relationship was always intact. But when he sinned, when he fell short, just like we do, we have broken fellowship. And as we break fellowship we and we pray God doesn't hear us, we have to confess our sins in order for God to hear us. Mm -hmm. God wants to hear from us. God wants to bless us. But as we walk in sin, it breaks fellowship. We break, in, 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 in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, can, he asks the question, will we continue in sin that because grace abounds? God forbid. We have grace. God keep giving us another chance because we belong to him. And because we belong to him, we're walking in relationship, right relationship. But when we fall out with God, when we sin and go against God's will, we fall out of fellowship. And when we fall out of fellowship, we're not glorifying him. God wants us to glorify him. Be glorified, God, through me. God, let me glorify you. God, be glorified through me. But he cannot be glorified through us unless we follow and obey him. He says, verse number 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you on last week that they put God and Jesus Christ on the same level. The reason why I put God and Jesus Christ on the same level is because Jesus Christ is deity. And if you really want to know the truth, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all on the same plane. They are, he is God. He is God in three persons. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, they are three in one. So he says to us again tonight that according to the grace of our God, according to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the same grace that exists through God unto us exists through Jesus Christ unto us. This grace that we have is because of Jesus Christ. It's because of God the Father. This grace affords us pleasure. This grace affords us joy. This grace affords us uh, a liberation. Grace is favor. Grace is unmerited favor. And we ought to have gratitude about it. It is a gift. It's a gift of God. Maybe somebody listening to me today that did not know that God's grace is available to you. I want to say to you tonight that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is available. All you have to do is accept him tonight. These two little verses point out to us that God has reconciled man back to himself. And he did it through Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. It's called the skull hill because it's shaped like a man's skull. Jesus took a tree. Jesus took a cross. Jesus took a stake. Jesus took a stick. And he marched up Calvary's hill. 
And he gave his life for you and for me. He died on that hill that day. He died on Calvary that day. He gave his life for you. And he gave his life for you, for me. They took him off the cross and they laid him in a borrowed tomb. A borrowed tomb because it belonged to Joseph, not to Jesus. A borrowed tomb because it was a tomb that no man had ever laid in. It was a borrowed tomb because he was going to give it back. And he gave it back early that third day morning. Jesus gave Joseph his brand new tomb back. He did it because he got up early that third day morning. He rose from the dead. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says it like this. If you can believe that Jesus is the son of God. That he died for your sins and rose from the dead. You can be saved tonight. You can be fit for heaven tonight. God's amazing grace is available for you tonight. Will you trust him? His grace is favor. His grace is unmerited favor, something that we can't work for. God's grace is sufficient for you and for me. The door of the church is open. If you can believe this simple story, that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus existed. Over 2,000 years ago, he gave his life on Calvary. They buried him. But the good news is he rose from the dead for you and for me. He got up early that third day morning. He got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He got up with enough power that you can believe this simple story and go to heaven when you die. If you can believe that story tonight, will you join me in prayer? Will you join me in inviting him into your life? Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed this prayer honestly, believing that this story will take you from earth to glory, we believe that you're born again. We believe that Jesus Christ has, has saved your soul. We believe that when you die, you're on your way to heaven. If this is you tonight, that you received Christ, inbox me and let me know that you received him so we can rejoice together. There may be others of you who, who struggle with sin, who every time you would to do good, evil is present with you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us. That we recommit. That we rededicate. That we repent. Father God, we come now, Lord. We ask you, Father God, to forgive us. God, we've fallen short. we messed up. We've sinned. We willfully sinned. We knowingly sin. I ask you to forgive us for it, Lord. Bless us, Father God, as we come to repent. We pray that you restore us. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. We have great gratitude to you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. For those of you who are without a church home or in between church homes, whether you're here in Houston or afar, I'd like to welcome you to the New Beginning Church. You can become a member. You can be a part. You can become one who is a part of this great body in Southwest Houston, Southeast Houston. 
If you would, just inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. There are some who have joined from a great distance. We welcome you also to join from a distance as we continue to, to serve the awesome God, glorify Him that He will glorify us because we will have glorified bodies one day. God has a way of blessing us and keeping us and He's doing that even right now through His amazing grace. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is it's again a time to give to the Lord. Will you give to the New Beginning Church? Will you give so this ministry can keep rolling? Will you give so you can bless the Lord through your giving? You can give in two ways. First of all, you can give by way of mail, U.S. Postal Service. You can give by way of U.S. Postal Service. And, and you can do that by mailing your tithes and your offerings to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459, 77459. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you for every giver. We thank you for blessing us, Father God, with money, with income, with increase. We thank you, Father God, that everyone is giving cheerfully. We're giving not grudgingly. We're giving, Father God, as unto you and unto you alone. We ask you to bless every gift and bless every giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. On our prayer list, we have Cassidy Raglan. This baby has a, has a praise report, but she still needs to meet our prayers. We're praying for Cassidy, Cassidy Raglan. We're praying for this baby. We're praying for Sister Nicole Davis' mother, Sister Ramona Mathis. We're praying for her. We're lifting her in prayer. We're praying for Ches <clears throat> We're praying for Chesia Vasquez, Velasquez. We're praying for the Velasquez family that they will be free from, from COVID-19, the entire family. We're praying, Father God, for, for we're praying to God for the COVID-19 victims, those who are suffering and those who are going through. Uh, we are praying also for the bereavements among us, bereaved family. We're praying for Walter Joe. We're praying for Walter Joe. We want to lift this young man in prayer. Uh, we're praying for his health and his strength. We want to pray for him. We're also praying for the the Woods and Hemingway family. We're praying for the Woods and Hemi, Hemingway family. First of all, we're praying for them for their bereaved moment. Cousin of mine went on to be with the Lord, Brother Pete Hemingway. We're praying for the Woods and Hemingway family. And we're also praying for their health and their strength as COVID-19 is ravishing and running a path by, by, by through family members of ours. We're also praying and uh, we are also honoring God for a praise report for Brother Larry Dixon. We're praying for his health. We're praying for Brother Larry Dixon and his health. We're praying for, for him. We also have a praise report for Sister Sandra Orr, Sarah Orr, so Sarah Orr. Sarah Orr, she's now cancer free, no more chemo has, has to be given. That's a good place to clap right there. I see you clapping all over the place. Thank you so much. That's a good praise report. She's cancer-free, and uh, they uh, they believe that they they've gotten all the cancer, and we know that God is able to heal. We thank God for that. So as as we spend time in prayer tonight, let's make sure we lift these before the Lord. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless you. We honor you. God, we praise you. We glorify you for you are the great King. You're the great God. We thank you, Father God, for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for, for just being good and being God. We come lifting these that names we've called out before you. We thank you for the praise reports, Father God. We thank you for protecting and keeping those. 
We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless those who we've called out. And there are many more that we don't we do not have the names to. But Lord, we ask you to bless from the baby to the oldest person. We pray that you give hope, give strength. We pray that you encourage. We pray, Father God, that you bless in the name of Jesus. We ask you, Father God, to continue to bless us in your word, that your word will go forward, Father God, and men, women, boys, and girls will see the results of your word. We ask you, Father God, to, to keep us now. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. Please, ma'am, please, sir, go ahead and look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we are on next week. Go ahead and look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Study it, look over it, and, and watch what God does in your life. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Before I go, I just want to let you know, second Sunday in September, I will be celebrating 17 years as the pastor of the New Beginning Church in Houston, Texas. I'll be celebrating 17 years. September the 12th will be 17 years to the date. 17 years to the date, 17 years to the day. I was officially elected as the pastor of the New Beginning Church on September the 7th. I preached my first sermon as the brand new pastor on September the 12th, 2004. September the 12th, 2004. Therefore, it is to the date and to the day. Second Sunday, uh, God has blessed us again to celebrate a new year, and we praise him for it, and we bless God's name for just doing what he has done. Please, ma'am, please, sir, continue to pray with us, pray for you, and you will be praying for us, and we thank you for it. And that's what Paul said, so we're going to be praying for you as you have been praying for us. In Jesus' name, good night. Have a blessed one. God bless.